think you gotta stop thinking about culture fit and start thinking about culture add. And that's the phrase that just changed my whole perspective on teamwork. Hmm. That if you have a group of people that think similarly, they're only gonna be as smart as the smartest or most powerful person in that group. Hmm. If you have a group of people who think differently, that group can add up to more. That's the only way the math works out, that you can become more than your smartest person. Hmm. Welcome to Eureka, where we talk about big ideas and how they came to be. I'm Josh Golden, and today we have on the show the co-founder of Contently, Shane Snow. I want to thank Verizon Media for being a proud supporter of Eureka. As an incubator of innovation and next-gen content, Verizon Media's trusted media ecosystem of premium brands like Yahoo and TechCrunch help consumers, advertisers, and media partners stay informed, entertained, and connected. Welcome to Eureka, where we talk about big ideas and how they came to be. I'm Josh Golden, your host, and today I have with me Shane Snow, the founder, co-founder of Contently. Shane, welcome to Eureka. I'm so excited to have a conversation with you. Thank you, I'm excited. I, uh, whenever um, you have a moment of inspiration or a moment of insight, sometimes there's a guttural utterance that comes out with it. What is your sound that you make when you come up with a big idea? So it's easier to think of other people in my life and the sound that they make Okay, uh, happy to have other people's sounds. I, I, you know, the, uh, the, the director of this, uh, this particular episode, I've heard him make the sound, ho, 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 when he comes up with an idea. <laughs> I don't know if, uh, if is that's that like Santa Claus? accurate. Brandon, is that, a, is that your Santa Claus? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, Brandon's Santa Claus. Yeah, I, I think for me, I, when I'm, I'm with myself, I do talk to myself. Uh, I think I do the, hmm. <laughs> I, I think that's more, more along the lines of, uh, <laughs> hmm is a more of a self-reflective sound versus like a yes or a, you know, it's, it's more like I'm... Well, I think for me, a lot of what my work is about is about discovering things and connecting dots. Right. And when I think about creativity, I really do think it's, be, I've explored this and I've explored this and I've explored this and now there's a connection between them. And that is sort of a hmm, you know, rather than a, than yes, I'm victorious. It's a, more of a discovery. That's so interesting to think about it. You actually think of a Eureka as something that already exists that has not been identified. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. Yeah, that's fascinating. Where 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 are you most creative? When I want to be in a more creative mode, for me, it's sitting down in a cafe that I've never been before. So a lot of my work is on the road, and so. It would, it would, I like to experience cities from cafes. And so sitting down in a place where there's things going on around, no one knows me, so no one's engaging me, mm. but I get to sort of take in the ambient, uh, this is a different environment. Mm. Generally, if I'm trying to feel creative, that's my happy place. Interesting. So you, anonymity is how you yeah. can feel creative. That's fascinating. Yeah. Do you actually seek out, like, I'm going to go there tomorrow for coffee and have a, have an idea, <laughs> make an idea happen over there? <laughs> it, sometimes it's more intentional. Well, so my the the last book that I wrote. It's a few years now, but uh, that you I were. I was, I, I love it. I uh, was honored enough that uh, that you were an early teams, reader yeah. of. And uh, when I was finishing the edits on it, I needed two weeks to just go heads down and, and finish edits. And I went to Amsterdam, which is a place I'd never been before. Okay, it's a little and dangerous place to go if you haven't been sure. there. Sure, <laughs> yeah, sure. And by myself, got a tiny hotel room, and every day I tried to go to a different neighborhood and just find coffee shops or bars to just hop around. So I'd be intentional about the neighborhood. Okay, I haven't been to this part of Amsterdam now. I'm gonna go to the outskirts. And, uh, and I just look on Google Maps and go to the nearest coffee shop or bar. It turns out in Amsterdam, coffee shop means like weed dispensary. <laughs> So the first couple of days, I was very confused. I was like, why are they not serving coffee here? Well, I guess I'll just plug away. And I don't really smoke, so it, you know, it was an interesting experience. But yeah, it's, it's more about not being familiar with where I am and, uh, and having that sort of, uh, I'm an explorer mode. Sure. And that gets me feeling creative. Even if I'm doing editing, it's not particularly That's creative. fascinating but. way to think about it. Can you describe, because I want to get to contently if I can, how did you get there? Like, just give me the... Was there a moment did, did it, like, that you discovered it? It was when one of my professors from journalism school, who was a, she was an adjunct professor, an editor at the New York Times. Would you like to name, name this human being? Uh, her name is Carla. She's, okay. she's wonderful. Okay, great. Um, and uh, she was laid off from the New York Times. They, they downsized and, uh, and she was laid off after decades at the New York Times. Mm. 
she taught me how to be a journalist, you know, and uh, amazingly talented person. And she became a freelancer. Mm. And, uh, you know, and the New York Times was hiring her back as a freelancer, you know, and that trend, I mean, it was really, it was, it was her. It was seeing, not only am I a freelance journalist, because that was my career, uh, and my friends who graduated with me were making it as independent workers, right. but the people who taught me how to do this craft are now becoming freelancers and realizing that there were more, there's more demand for her skills mm. than ever before because of these brands. So that was really the moment where I realized this is not something that's you know just gonna come back, like everyone's just gonna hire all the journalists back and photographers will get full-time jobs. Like, no, that wasn't coming back. It was the opposite trend. Creative workers were gonna be on their own, but the demand for, uh, for that talent was never going to go away if mm. the internet was going to continue growing and brands were going to be publishers. So. That's fascinating. Uh, what do you think makes an idea person? Well, so I, I have a little bit of a bias when it comes to the term idea Sorry. person. So no, no it's, why, it's fine. I, actually, I'd love to explore this with you. Yeah. So you hear when uh, I've interviewed so many people for jobs now as I like, yeah. started contently and then suddenly I'm like a manager and, you know, right. uh, and went from journalist to, to running teams. And, uh, and when you interview people, you hear the same things over and over again. So like, what are your strengths? Sure. People say, I'm a people person or I'm an idea person to the point that like, I know there are people who are incredible at those two things, <laughs> but I've heard so many people say I'm an idea person and it's been code for, I don't like to do hard work that like, oh, I, I have oh, this. Oh, that's so rude. Really? Where, I'm never going to say that again. Well, no, where <laughs> I think someone who's truly an idea person is someone who will take the idea and make sure it's bulletproof and make it happen. Right. Yeah. For me to clear the bar of you actually are an idea person, yeah. it would be that it's that you not only can source ideas, but you can make them happen, but you also are willing to let go of ideas when they won't work. If you hang on to an idea, that's a bad idea. You don't poll people, you don't mm. explore with other people whether it's a good idea or not, you don't shore it up, then you're not an idea person, you're a, a person who is really wants something to happen Output. but isn't willing to do the work to right. see if it's really a good idea. I am I am fascinated by finding out the, 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 the beginnings of your life, Shane. Now, I happen to know a little bit about you personally, but I'm sure not everyone does. So um, tell me about what you were like as a young person and how you, how you evolved into journalism and then obviously into Contently. So the story that just popped in my mind it, is, is the one from your book because I, I, there's a great, there's a, there's, I'm sorry, I'll t oh. you tell, you tell the one. I want to know which you, one you're thinking. No. <laughs> the story that popped in my mind when you said that is uh, when I was in third grade, we moved uh, across the county in Southeast Idaho, where I'm from. I went to a new school. And, uh, and the first day of school, uh, a fellow third grader comes up to me and she says, I'm Ashley and I just want you to know, since you're new here, that I'm more popular than you. <laughs> and by the way, we went on to become dear friends. <laughs> but, uh, but what I said back to her is, I'm Shane, I'm new here, and I'm smarter than you. <laughs> so not so humble as a little kid. <laughs> Well, it's good that at third grade, was it eight? You, so, you were, uh, so you were aware of your intellectual capacity. Yeah, and I saw that as my, that's as my your, thing. Your, I, your, I, your I loved reading. My dad's an engineer. We lived in the middle of nowhere in Idaho because he worked at a nuclear power plant in the middle of nowhere. And so I grew up with his dad, who's a scientist, and uh, you know, he's an auto mechanic before that. And uh, so I grew up with engineering and taking cars apart. And, uh, and my mom sort of tricked me and my brother into reading lots of books <laughs> and and so I saw that as, uh, that's what I'm about. I, I was a small kid and I was a little bit shy, but I, I knew that what I loved was learning mm. and figuring things out. I'm curious for you, either in the, in the development of all any of your books or of Contently, was there a moment that was like, this is going to change everything? I, I think about this a lot because I think that there's, there's turning points all the time, right? right. Uh, and there's been moments when mentors of mine have said exactly the right thing that I needed mm -hmm. to just change my trajectory or change my perspective. And there's a few of them, the, uh, the one I'll share so I don't take this whole interview. No, I love it. Is uh, early on at Contently, a, few, a couple years in, I was fretting about building teams and work that eventually went into the book Dream Teams as I became so passionate and obsessed with this idea of groups of people that add up to more than the sum of their parts. Uh, but I was fretting about how my role had changed from the craftsman, the person who does things, mm. to the team leader, the person who helps other people do things and mm. hopefully not fight. And, uh, and I was fretting about that and I had a mentor named Charlie Kim who's uh, the CEO of a company called Next Jump. 
Mm -hmm. And Charlie had sort of taken me under his wing and I would go and I'd meet with him and his co-founder every few weeks to just pepper them with questions and ask, how do I do this thing? And I was fretting about hiring. We had this group of people who were very talented and great, but I realized after some job interviews that didn't go well, mm -hmm. that you look around the office and there's a whole lot of people that would look around and say, I don't fit in here. Mm. And, uh, you know, we were 10 guys from Ivy League schools in our late 20s who all right. loved video games and two interns named Lauren. Like, that was the company. And, uh, and I was writing about, like, we have this amazing culture. So how do I hire for culture fit right. without alienating, you know, a, a woman walks in as an executive and she's like, oh, it's going to be me and these 20-year-old dudes? Like, yeah. that's not, and not even getting into race or, you know, geographic diversity or, you know, age diversity. There's all these things that I was sort of writing about. How do we set up this company so that we can have culture fit? And Charlie said, I think you gotta stop thinking about culture fit and start thinking about culture ad. And yeah. that's the phrase that kicked off a whole bunch of stuff that led to dream teams in part, but uh, just changed my whole perspective on teamwork. Hmm. That if you have a group of people that think similarly, they're only gonna be as smart as the smartest or most powerful person in that group. Hmm. If you have a group of people who think differently, that group can add up to more. That's the only way the math works out, that you can become more than your smartest person. Mm. And, uh, and just shifting that perspective of, I'm not looking for people to fit who we are and what we like and where we're coming from. I'm looking for people who can push me to think differently. Mm. But that requires a whole bunch of other things. Like I gotta get good at listening. I gotta get good at debate and not taking things personal. I gotta help other people not do that. I gotta get good at changing my mind and not having it hurt my ego so bad. So there's this waterfall of things that happens when you start to look at collaboration uh, and thinking as this process of not you trying to have the answers, but you trying to find the people that can push you to be it's better than you would see on your own. So one of the things I, I'm curious for, for Contently or for any of the innovations that you develop, is there, do you believe in serendipity? It sounds like you do a little bit, like you believe that the, that the world is there for you to, be, to discover it. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I think there's there's ways to maximize your chance of serendipity, but there's some things... <laughs> I have to know that. How I, do you maximize serendipity? Did you ever hear about the study of, uh, or the story of Ted Sarandos at Netflix? And uh, No, I don't know this one. So this, uh, I learned about this in a book called The Creative Curve by Alan Gannett, who's awesome, a uh, dear friend. So he, uh, he interviewed Ted Sarandos about his... You should, Thoughts. you know, you should, yep. yeah. I'll get him. <laughs> yeah, you should get him. Call Ted, Brandon. This is a guy at Netflix who, he's now co-CEO, yes. but he was the guy who was in charge of the, what content they acquired, what movies they put in the catalog, and what new shows and movies they would create. So he's, uh, he's that guy, the content guy at Netflix. His backstory is when he was a teenager, he worked at a, uh, a TV, a video rental store. The, not, not, the, not the blockbuster that's dead, but... Some, like, some I think it was an independent one. Doesn't matter, right, yeah. That's so in my head, it's this pimply teenager who's like at the desk, bored, <laughs> people come in and they ask for movie recommendations. So he took it on himself to watch every movie in this little store. Oh my God. So when you come in and you say, I loved this movie, he can say, well, I have a movie for you. Right. So he became a human recommendation engine. <laughs> you can imagine this kid grows up and gets into the movies and he becomes the guy building the recommendation engine at Netflix. But the moral of that story is that if you have all of that content in your head, you have a lot better chance of making good recommendations yes. for movies. And I think with creativity, if creativity really is about making connections, which is my philosophy, right. then the more things you have to draw from to make connections for, the more chance you have of coming up with something great. Mm. So yeah, so serendipity, I think, you know, it's luck. It's what you run into. But if you have more things in that pool to run into, then, then that increases the chances, I think, that you run into something great. I, I, I know that there's always the, uh, the criticisms that come when, when as an innovator, um, you know, that there's so many assumptions you need to overcome. And as people who are listening to this or watching this are gonna to think to themselves, how did you know that it was an idea that was worth it mm -hmm. to go dump your likes efforts into? <laughs> and what assumptions did you need to overcome to be like, actually, we're gonna, I know it sounds stupid, but we're doing it. Yeah. Um, so how, what, were there assumptions that you needed to overcome? Absolutely. And I think that's become part of my process now with new ventures, um, you know, stuff that I'm working on now with online education and with television and even children's books. Yeah. Uh, at the start of any project, I, my habit is make a list of assumptions that we're making about this oh. and let's eliminate 
the negative assumptions. What are the things that could kill this? What are the things we're assuming that have to be true and let's prove them? So that is part of the process. And I think some of that comes from the experience with Contently and, and other projects since where relying too heavily on assumptions that have changed because technology's changed, the world's changed, or we're just wrong, the best practice is outdated, uh, sets you back you right. know, if you rely too much on that. I like to, when I'm working on, I on an idea, go kind of ping my brain trust yeah. of people who are going to be naysayers on this idea, yeah, so who come important. from very different perspectives, who hate the stuff that I'm working on. Uh, but my invitation to, hey, tell me what you think could go wrong with this, tell me what you don't like about this, helps me to shore up, either get rid of assumptions or shore up the, the idea itself. So I'm not walking in right. you know, sort of naively. And I think a lot of people are afraid of that. You have something that you care about. You're so passionate about this idea that you're afraid to ask people to shoot holes in it mm. uh, because that it's so personal. But if you flip it and you invite people to shoot holes in it, then it's no longer, them finding the holes is no longer finding holes in your ego. <laughs> yes, yes. It's you figured it out mm. through them. And, uh, and so it hurts less badly. And also now you've, you're making your idea better. Just before I get to your fun questions, I want to ask you a really hard one. Tell me about your moment of biggest failure, like just massive, unbridled, destructive, wow, this sucked. Well, so the one that, that hurts the worst is uh, one of my business partners at Contently, Dave, and I, before Contently, we had started working on a project that we abandoned mm. in favor of Contently that was basically Pinterest before Pinterest. <laughs> and then we abandoned it because we couldn't figure out quite how to oh. do it. And then, uh, and then we started Contently, and I'm not complaining because Contently is great. It's made a yeah. huge impact. I, I'm so grateful for it. But then Pinterest happened, <laughs> and we're like, that was what we were working Guys. on. Guys! So that sucks. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, one that comes to mind that I, I'm ashamed of, but I've learned so much from that I think for, at a personal level really taught me a lot is I, uh, it's 10 years ago now probably, I was at an event at General Assembly. Uh, it was like a panel discussion yeah. about tech oh, nerd right. stuff. Um, and, uh, and I was on the panel, and at some point in the panel, I described this thing that Google had done to its algorithm or whatever as retarded. Oh, no, yeah. And, yeah, but I did not know. So, I, you know, I, two years, uh, not even two years, you know, I had just gotten here like a year before from Idaho, where I grew up, and that's how we talked. Oh, and that's someone tough. after this uh, panel came up to me from the audience and said, hey, Shane, and uh, this... It, this is why this sticks with me so much, is the, yeah. the charity that she showed me in this conversation. She said, hey, Shane, I don't know you. You seem like a genuine guy and a really good person. And I have to tell you that when you said that, that I felt shocked and uncomfortable. And, uh, and I think that my, my story is that you don't know that that's not okay. Right. And that there's people who could take that very, uh, very badly. And that could ruin everything else that you have to say but also it's just not okay and uh and i i was like oh my god i you know i had no idea i'm i'm so sorry but thank you for being nice about it right and uh and so i, I consider that a failure because i should have known better and i was 23 years old or however old i was but and that's um, a tremendous learning I, I learned i think two big things you know one you don't know what uh when someone makes a mistake um, especially something like mm. that that could hurt someone else you don't know the story behind it, why they made that mistake, and uh, and whether that's a blind spot or an intentional thing or not, you don't know someone's intention, and uh, and just starting from that point just takes away a lot of the anger when things happen that you see, you observe people. I mean, as a boss, this is huge. You observe well, you give people. Give someone the benefit. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Maybe you didn't know this. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, and the other part of it though is she came and helped teach me something, but she did so with charity. She didn't leave with, how dare you. Mm. Uh, you know, you scumbag. She led with, I assume that you're a good person and I think you don't mean any harm by mm. this, but I have to tell you uh, that this is, uh, this is something that you need to know and take seriously. And I think for days I felt terrible about myself. Like I'm a bad person. Like my whole life I've been probably making people feel bad. Uh, and then after I got over that and made it not about me, I realized this is a lesson that I can take forward that when I observe people do things that I think are bad or wrong or disagree with or make my blood boil or I see them hurt someone else. Mm. Like you got to do something. You got to step in. But instead of standing up in front of everyone at the panel and being like, you, you. <laughs> approach them one-on-one -on -one and show them charity. And, uh, and that has helped me so much with the hard conversations I've had to have in my life. 
And I wish, I wish that I, I grew up in a, a place where, you know, my friends and I hadn't talked like that, mm. you know, but, uh, but I don't, I'm, I'm glad I learned that lesson that way. Wow. What a good one. That's a, and, and uh, whoever that person is, what a wonderful moment. I, know, I don't even know who she is. Yeah. That's fabulous. What a great, great, great insight. Hi there, I'm here with Joe Lambert, the head of consumer for Verizon Media. Joe, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Joe, do you have a moment of uh, inspiration or eureka moment you can share? Okay, so this eureka moment goes back about 16 years and it was when I was back in Sydney, Australia. Okay. Our daughter was 10 months old and went to daycare. Look, at the time I was really trying to hold it all together. You know, at work, family, friends, my husband wasn't around. And then my first interstate business trip came up. <laughs> you know what though? I thought it would be a piece of cake because I planned to go and stay with friends so I could take a million. Sure. <laughs> of course the day comes, I get to the daycare, I run in stressed out about the work, getting ready for the meeting, getting to the airport on time, making my flight. I swing around the door to her classroom and she's sitting in a plastic high chair. She's finger painting, wearing nothing but a nappy, or you'd call it a diaper here. And she's <laughs> covered head to toe everywhere in bright green paint. Ooh, that must have been a little inconvenient to go on a plane with. Just, just to say a little bit, yes. Look, it sounds so silly now, but I was so stressed out and so super concerned about missing that flight and you know, taking a green baby on the plane and being judged by everybody <laughs> on the way. So anyway, I pick up Amelia, I throw a t-shirt on her paint and all, and off we go. We make the flight. Needless to say, I'm also now covered in, in green paint too. And, you know, anyway, life happens and we just had to live through that moment. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, what a stressful moment. Uh, what, uh, what insight did you take away from that? The, the eureka moment for me was, you know, life happens and you just can't control everything and and when stuff happens you just need to stay zen and do the best you can in the moment yeah. um but also the second piece is like don't put unnecessary pressure on yourself you know you think that people are judging you and critical of you all the time like you just need to be kind to yourself and you know i was just way 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 too focused on what other people were thinking and trying to make everything happen uh by myself um, you know, now when I talk about this story, particularly when I'm coaching and talking to other young parents, um, this, this story really resonates. It resonates because of finding that Zen in an uncontrollable moment. And of course, you know, I always tell this part of the story as well. You know, Amelia and I still today laugh about this story. I could not tell you what that business meeting was about. Oh my God, Joe, that is the most important insight. It isn't the business meeting that you remember. It's, it's, the, moment, uh, it's the moment that you shared with your daughter. What, what an important uh, eureka moment to share. Thank you so much for offering it. Thank you so much. Tell me a moment where you thought you just might be dreaming, but it was real. Honestly, the first time I tried VR. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing that comes to mind. Is a Game of Thrones simulation at South by Southwest or something. Oh my God. You put the VR headset on and they put a fan on you and you go up to the wall on Game of Thrones. And, uh, and I almost lost my balance and it's like my fear of heights came up. Oh my God. And, uh, and so that's what comes to mind. Like I was like, this cannot possibly be what I'm experiencing. Uh, you, and then when and people in the future watch this interview, they're like, oh, VR, so Yeah, <laughs> no, because I thought VR was like, this is not going to take off. Like VR right. is going to, and then I tried it and I was like, this is, where's the money that I can invest in? Where do I invest it in? Right. Uh, yeah, like get a mortgage and invest in VR. What's the most that you've ever gambled um, and what's your game? So the, the highest stakes thing that I can think of in recent memory is uh, my friends and I, we, we go watch Formula One every couple of weeks whenever it's, it's on at like eight in the morning. Yeah. We go to the one bar in New York that's, watching, we'll, it, we'll, right? that's it. watching it and we'll serve you. And, uh, and we make bets on who will win. And I, I bet uh, 60 push-ups on <laughs> Charles Leclerc from Ferrari to win. <laughs> and he got fourth. And so 60 push-ups was Ooh, the... That's a tough... It's a lot of push-ups. <laughs> so that was, that was the most I've bet recently. <laughs> What, when you're at a cocktail party, what's your go-to move? Getting into a good story, asking someone to like, hold on, you said that, tell me more about that. Like the, the get someone to share a fun story is, is, is the thing that I love doing at cocktail parties. If I can not pull a great story out of someone, 
my go-to move is to pretend I'm someone I'm not oh, and get people to ask me human? questions. So I've I've done the Formula One thing, you know. Oh, your Formula One, right? You know, yeah. Right. They're like, uh, so yeah. So what do you do? And I, you know, I say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a Formula, I'm a Formula One, One driver, but I blow out my knee, and so right now I'm on. <laughs> and, uh, Did that eliminate a person from being a Formula One driver? By the way, I have. I don't think so. I mean, actually, I think you know it's probably pretty physically intense. Break, yeah. But it's like it's a joke. So if someone picks up on the joke, then it's fun. And oh, if okay. someone doesn't, then you go, with, go it. with it. <laughs> Usually, someone will jump on board with you. For that, like, you should be like, oh, well, I'm actually a lion tamer. And, you know, that's, yeah, (laughs) that's awesome. Shane, I got to tell you, this is, I, I, uh, I'd love talking with you about both your, your eureka moments, as well as uh, all the things in between in your books. It's just, you are a perfect archetypal person for the, um, to have on on the show. You're fabulous. Thank you so much. I think that's so kind of you to say it's uh, absolutely my honor. Thank you. 